All right, and those that are staying here, you can go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 2. Romans, chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 24 in just a few minutes. We're continuing our series called Sayings of Saints. These are wisdom sayings. They're certainly based on the Bible, as our saints that we've been looking at are fully steeped in Scripture. And we're going to be jumping forward this morning. We've been looking at the Abbas and Amas of the ancient Christian desert spirituality, but we're going to jump forward 700 plus years this morning and look at a saint that you're probably at least familiar with his name. His name was St. Francis of Assisi. And if you're not familiar necessarily with his name, you've probably seen a statue of him someplace, whether at a church or a retreat center or just out in the woods at a peaceful place. Uh, And you'll recognize his statue because he's always surrounded by animals. It's said that he used to preach to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. In fact, legend says that one time there was a wolf that was harassing a small village and Francis came out and preached to the wolf and he became a tame wolf and no longer harassed the village. These legends grow, but there's always some sort of aspect of truth behind them. And the truth is, is that St. Francis cared for all of creation and all of God's creatures. Francis was born in Assisi, Italy in 1181 AD. His father was a wealthy cloth merchant. He also owned uh, farmland in Assisi, so he was rather well-to-do. His mother was a beautiful French woman, and it is said that Francis actually got his name. His mother had actually named him something different, but when his father came home and found out that he had a son, he actually renamed him Francis after the homeland of his beautiful mother, who he loved very much. Francis though, was a rather entitled child. He grew up in a wealthy family of the time and it said that he was used to fine food, fine wine, and wild celebrations. In fact, he was the envy of the young men of Assisi who wanted to be more like him. He left school at the age of 14. Don't get any uh, ideas, Soren. <laughs> and he was known around town for really living it up. He was, of course, expected to follow in his father's footsteps in the textile business, but he was bored by the prospect of life in the cloth trade. But instead, he daydreamed of becoming a knight. A knight would have been one of the medieval action figures of his time, you know, like the Marvel comics of today. And soon he would be given the opportunity as war beckoned. In 1202 AD, war broke out between Assisi and Perugia, which was just a few miles away. Francis eagerly took up his place with the cavalry, and it wouldn't be long uh, before he would be transformed by this encounter. War would change him forever. The men of Assisi came under heavy attack. They were outnumbered by the men of Perugia, and being unskilled, Having no combat experience or training, Francis was quickly captured. In fact, the whole battlefield was covered with bodies, mostly bodies of the fallen men of Assisi, and even those surviving troops of Assisi were mostly put to death rather than being captured and imprisoned. But since he was dressed like an aristocrat, having very fancy and expensive new armor, the people of Perugia realized that this guy's worth some money. So rather than kill them, he put, they put Francis up for ransom. They held him in a dark, dank cave where he would stay for nearly a year while negotiations were being worked out with his father for what kind of payment could be expected. I hope my dad would love me more than that. <laughs> During this time of imprisonment in this dark dungeon, wasn't very good conditions at all, Francis began receiving visions from God. After a year of negotiations, the ransom was finally accepted and Francis was released in 1203 AD. When he came back to Assisi, he was a very different man. He was sick in both mind and body, a casualty of war. But now in his early 20s, he began turning his focus toward God. He spent increasing the amount of time in mountain hideaways and in old dilapidated churches that were no longer being used, but he could be found there praying. He was seeking answers. 
And one of the noticeable changes is that he used to fear lepers desperately, wanted nothing to do with them, wanted no, didn't want to be around them. And now he felt called and compassionate to care for these lepers and their sickness. It is said that while he was praying before an old crucifix at the church of San Damiano, Francis heard the voice of Christ saying, rebuild the church, rebuild the church. Francis first took this quite literally. And there were a number of old dilapidated churches that were no longer in use. And he began raising money and physically actually working on restoring these churches. Unfortunately, much of the money that he used to restore the churches came from his father without his father's permission. His father became increasingly frustrated with him because Francis kept selling his father's belongings. Things that Francis was able to use, like his horse, one day he sold and he used the money to be able to help people in need and put money toward being able to get resources to rebuild one of the broken down churches in Assisi. He would also take reams of cloth, expensive cloth, and he would sell it and he would use the money for the same purposes. In fact, one day he saw a beggar on the side of the road and he looked down at his own fine clothes and he saw the beggar dressed in rags and he went and he traded his clothes with the beggar. The beggar, is said, went off quite happy. Francis' dad was quite upset. It was his cloth that these clothes were spun from. And so his father beat and dragged Francis before the local bishop. The bishop rightfully ordered Francis to return his father's money and to stop spending money that didn't really belong to him. At this, Francis stripped off his fine clothes that he was once again in, and he laid them at his father's feet. And this is what he said. He said, until now, I have called you my father on earth, but henceforth I can truly say, our father who art in heaven. Witnessing this, the bishop was deeply moved and he grabbed an old tunic and he wrapped Francis in it. And Francis became a son of the church from that day. These humble clothes would be the same kind of cloth that later Franciscans would wear. Francis, from that point on, devoted himself to a life of extreme poverty, not taking anything that didn't belong to him anymore. He was soon joined by 12 loyal followers, and he began to live and to teach the simple principles and teachings of Christ. These followers became known as Franciscan friars, and they sought to simply become humble and simple and loving as Christ himself. Francis gained a deeper understanding of those words that he heard from Christ when Jesus told him to rebuild his church. And he understood that his mission wasn't to restore brick and mortar, but to restore the church, which is the body of Christ, toward the simple ways and love of Jesus from which it had lost its way. One of the Christian principles that Francis sought to restore was the principle of loving service rather than forceful power over others, which the church of that time had embraced. So the wisdom saying that comes to us today from Francis is this, and maybe you're already familiar with it. it. says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Though Francis's dealings with his father in the beginning are certainly questionable, and I question the way he treated his father in disowning him, in time, Francis would learn the principles of love. In fact, in 1219, amidst what is known as the fifth Christian crusade against the Muslims, in order to try to regain Jerusalem and the Holy Land, Francis made a pilgrimage to Egypt where the crusaders were on the front lines fighting against the Sultan and his warriors. He comes to the front lines and the first thing he does is he preached to the, preaches to the crusaders. And he declares to them, boldly yet lovingly, that killing people for land is not the way of Christ. Now this was news to the crusaders who were being told by the Pope of the time that if they died in battle, they were assured that they would have spent no time in purgatory, they would immediately go to glory and all their sins would be forgiven. And Francis says, actually what you're doing is a form of sin. And then he boldly crosses the Nile River into enemy territory and he asks for a, an audience with the Sultan who denied him the first two times, but seeing Francis's persistence, 
he allows him to come and he invites Francis for dinner and he dines with him. So Francis gains an audience with a sultan, Sultan Malek al Kamil. In that audience, Francis shares his faith and what he understood as the true teachings and ways of Christ. The sultan doesn't convert, but he's so impressed by Francis that he asked Francis if Francis would always pray for him. The sultan was so amazed by Francis' love and humility and his plea for the way of peace that it said that both men were deeply transformed by the encounter. The sultan would, of course, continue to defend his lands against the invaders. But rather than kill Francis, he gave him a horn of protection, literally a horn that was used for the Muslim call to prayer. And with this horn, Francis was given free passage back through the land to return to the crusaders. When Francis came across those lines and was alive and well and unharmed and had stories of meeting with the sultan, the crusaders were amazed because they never believed that he'd ever come back in one piece. Francis was called to rebuild a church that was in disrepair. It meant that the church had fallen far from the ways of Christ. Francis sought to restore the Christian principle of overcoming hate with love, a principle that was so part of the heart of Christ and the teachings of Christ that you wonder how the church ever lost their way. At this point in history, church history, might made right. And if you could overpower, it was seen as a sign of blessing from God. And Francis said, no, the only sign of blessing from God is that we're actually following the ways of Christ. And whether you live or whether you die, you are blessed if you're found in these ways. Francis declares, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. How desperately we need to return to this foundational principle today. Francis does two things. He graciously teaches the crusaders about the true way of Christ, seeking to return them to genuine Christian principles. The second thing he does is he power, powerfully demonstrates what it looks like to love one's enemy by crossing those enemy lines and going and being received into the court of the sultan himself. And he comes to the sultan in love and with honor, yet proclaiming Christ and his salvation. The sultan does not convert, but he sought Francis's prayers because he recognized the spirit of truth in this holy man. Which leads us to our implication and our lesson for today. Our greatest witness for Christ is our own transformation. Amen? Amen. Our greatest witness for Christ is our own transformation. Our witness begins by looking carefully at our own lives. And that's Paul's call this morning in Romans chapter 2, verses 17 to 24. There he's writing to the Jewish people of his day, and he says, Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have the law, the embodiment of the knowledge of truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The word of the Lord. It's a hard word, but it's a good word. And what I love about it is, it, you know, it's a rebuke, but it's a call toward humility, which is at the center of our faith. In this passage, Paul is addressing the devout Jews of his day but what he says to them could easily be said to the Christian community of our day. They have their beliefs, they have their standards, they have their expectations. 
They look at the world and they see how the world is failing in all of these areas. Whether they're right or wrong about this is of little consequence. What matters is that they recognize their own shortcomings. Paul insinuates that they are guilty of all the same things that they find fault in others. He says, you preach against stealing, you preach against sexual immorality, you preach against idolatry, but do you do these things? And I imagine that the Jewish people would have said, no, we don't. But Paul says, yes, you do, maybe in less obvious ways, but you do. You say you're against idols, but do you steal from temples? Do you make money off of remelting that, those metals and selling them? Has money itself become your idol? The revelation of the gospel is that we all fall short, often in less obvious, but perhaps even more profound ways. I love the Book of Common Prayer and what it says in its confession. This book has been used for hundreds of years by the church, and we don't use the book ourselves, but in our confession that we use whenever we do our communion service, we use the words that come out of that book. And what I love about that confession is it says this. It says, forgive us for what we've done. But then it goes on to say another part that I think is often overlooked. And for what we've left undone. Do you know that we sin not only by what we do, but by what we don't do, that we're called to do? So what is the key to a redemptive love of others? I believe that it's understanding our own deep need for God's redemptive love for ourselves. How did Paul come upon the truth that he's now sharing in this passage? I mean, he himself was a Jew who himself would have admitted beyond all he was persecuting others. He was treating others poorly. He was beating and killing others. And he, doing it, thought he was righteous. Thought he was doing what God wanted as he was persecuting the Christian church. But when he was confronted by Christ on the road to Damascus, he was confronted with his own sinfulness. And this honest confrontation with his own self led him to declare in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. This is not self-condemnation for Paul. It's a grateful recognition of the depth and the grace of God's restoring love. It wasn't until he was able to see his own brokenness, his own dysfunction, his own need for God's grace, that he was transformed and able to have grace on others. Jesus said it this way, for the one who has been forgiven much, loves much. Do you know how you can tell when someone's truly a follower of Christ, really sincere? They love much because they realize the incredible grace and love God has had for them. Francis, a wannabe knight who experiences defeat in battle, ironically discovers victory in defeat. And this is the way of the cross. The Franciscans these days actually use that as a term, the way of the cross, and they say it's the path of descent, which is a path toward humility. And this path of descent is actually what lifts us up before God. It is the peacemakers, the scripture says, who will inherit the earth. Not those who seek to win by swaying power over others. It is the defeated, who will be the victorious. And those who seek to defeat others, in the end, they will be the defeated. The hatred that God calls us to overcome is the hatred in our own hearts. And even this can only be overcome by love, embracing God's redemptive love for us. And when we cease to hate ourselves, we will cease to hate others. When we cease to hate ourselves, we will cease to hate others. And then the power of love will change the world, not the love of power. Amen? Let's pray.
Father, we give you thanks for the life and teachings in the way of Christ. It is good. It is right. It is beyond understanding or conception. It is ironic. It looks backwards and inside out. And yet giving up his life was the path to life. May you help us to follow Christ in a world that tells us that power over is truly power. May you help us to know what it means and looks like in our own lives to come with power under, upholding, restoring, redeeming, loving, forgiving, being with rather than against, that we might truly be known as your disciples in a way that truly changes the world. May this change begin in our own lives. May it impact our neighbors in ways that they want this kind of love for themselves. And may we, through both word and witness, proclaim that this love is available through your Son, Jesus Christ, who came not to condemn the world, but to redeem it. May this be our way as well. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Sue and Pam, if you'd come and meet us in the song of response.